Recording is on. Hey guys. Hi. Why, well, thank you for recording this meeting already. Okay. You are, of course, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Um, on the call today, just for reference. Yeah, Abe, so we can maybe Clear the note page. We can do it. Okay, can I get somebody to volunteer for the note taking? Please. Oh, Nathan, hi, you're here. I see you. Yeah, I am. Sorry, sorry, I uh, couldn't join the call uh, last week. I had this just terribly slow data, so uh, I've no. had, I, I have Wi-Fi now. Okay, cool. Do you have video? You're in Japan right now, so you're at 5 a.m.? Yeah, I am. <clears throat> okay. Hey. Yeah. Hi, Nathan. Uh, good morning. Good, good. Uh, what are you doing in Japan, by the way? Uh, mostly just skiing. Doing what? Skiing. Skiing? Yeah. This, the snow here is really good, so, um, yeah, I just figured I'd, figured I'd try that out for a bit. Excellent. Uh, believe it or not, they have a ski slope near Kansas City, Missouri, and it's actually not bad at all. <laughs> well, is it not bad? Okay. Well, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Maybe next winter. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's let's start the meeting here. So a few updates here. Well, maybe, hey, let's start with Nathan. Tell, tell us what you're doing. So, so with Nathan, he came in on a team, and we're, um, first of all, welcome to the team. Thanks. And... Um, Working on the actual 3D printable house model for the OBI build kit, so 3D printable CD go home designs. Tell us a little more on that, Nathan. Yeah, uh, sure thing. So um, basically, um, for the 
for the latest designs, I'm waiting for Katarina to, to post the, um, the the latest designs that she wants me to replicate in the 3D scale model. Um, I've got two so far, and then I'm kind of uh, thinking about ideas for the connectors, um, just for uh, like how, how do you how do we connect the modules. Um, Martin's idea was magnets. Uh, I think the scale that we're working with, which is like a quarter inch uh, scale, you know, as, like equals a, a foot in real life. Um, that is going to result in really thin parts. So I don't know if there's magnets mm -hmm. small, like small enough for that. We probably need like sixteenth inch magnets uh, to to make that work. So I'm thinking, I'm kind of thinking about a couple different ideas. Um, one would be just like every like like kind of like a like a a pin and hole connector, sort of like a Lego style connector um, between the modules. Um, I'm thinking about that. Um, that would kind of result in a lot of extra holes in, in the different modules just for um, flexibility in, in terms of assembly. Um, another idea I'm thinking is the same kind of connector, but um, every time where there is a constraint joining the two, like, so for example, two wall modules together, if you ran a Python script analyzing for constraints, and then you basically um, just did sort of like a custom um, like hole and pin, I'm, I'm looking into that as well. Uh, and then our other options are maybe like a, well, I mean, there's always rubber cement, uh, but that that kind of shoots us in the foot in terms of uh, disassembly and everything. So just just kind of just kind of fiddling around with those ideas. I've I put it all in my design doc, and it's it's all in the log. So all all, awesome. all in my, my work log. Excellent, thank you. And if you click on, um, I just put the link to those small magnets. They do have. One eighth inch by one sixteenth small neodymium magnets. If you want to okay. put a click on that? That's definitely doable. They they have that are also very strong. So that that could definitely be a route to go. Like for example, if you do like a hole in the module where you just simply push fit, press fit the little magnet or something like that. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, take a look at that. Um, okay. I'll, I'll I'll take a look. I mean, for yeah. for. For any wall that's like you know six and a half inches thick, it would work. Uh, but we have smaller stuff. Uh, I I need to look through all the modules to kind of yeah uh, get a better idea. But okay, cool. I'll um I'll okay. take a look. That's cool. Um, thank you. Who wants to go next in, in terms of a little bit of report? Anyone? I can uh, have some stuff. Okay. Eric? Hi. So um, I've been uh, working on the 3D printer a bit, um, troubleshooting that. So the uh, axes and uh, software and everything, um, heat bed um, and the heating of the extruder seems to work all right. Um, but uh, yeah, the extruder still not working quite um, up to par where it needs to be. Um, and I'm having some issues with the uh, the initial print sticking to the to the heat bed. Okay. Uh, so I'm I do have the parts for the larger uh, extruder, um, and so uh, I'm going to print the 3D parts for that and probably put together that extruder. Huh. Uh, which which extruder are you talking about? The the Titan Arrow? No, the very large one um, from. E3D. I don't remember the exact name though, top of my head. The uh, over one millimeter nozzle, I think it is. Oh, okay, okay. So you you're saying you're just uh, using a bigger nozzle, or? I haven't used it yet. Um, I have to get the 3D parts to put together that extruder. Oh, the modified one with a bigger. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. So you're going straight to modification with the larger extruder system. Like larger, because it's a little bit. You you mean the tight the yeah the volcano nozzle the larger yeah. heat block, which means you got to use a little modification there. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's my plan. Yeah, yeah. That's that sounds good. Um, what else to say about sticking to bed? That issue. Uh, I know there's a very clear answer to that, and one solution to that is. I have 70 degrees Celsius for the bed for PLA now because that's 
when you get bulletproof sticking. So, so you use a kind of lower temperature, moderate temperature? Oh, actually, higher. I think we were talking about 50. Okay. Celsius before. It works flawlessly with 70 C. Yeah, I've been uh, trying PLA and ABS. Uh -huh. Been having a little bit better uh, luck with the ABS, but uh, yeah, you use a higher temperature usually. For the yeah. Bed. Yeah. No, haven't haven't had sticking to bed issues. Like once you get the temperature to seventy, and uh, just make sure. That the only other thing is wipe it with some some alcohol or acetone. Okay. In case there's grease on a surface, that grease will t definitely like hand grease or other grease. Um, definitely make it not stick. So, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I'll work on that. And uh, I'm also trying to figure out how to open source some of my work, um, some of the biological stuff. Uh, so that's still conversation between uh, professors and the university and trying to see what we can do. Any notable updates on that one or? or... Uh, no one else seems to get it. So, um, I might just have to kind of go it alone, start start on my own, not so mm -hmm. much within the institution. Yeah. Right. Start new university system. Interestingly, I ran to just one update on education. There's a, let's see, if you go to my log, look at a very interesting guy. And I, I posted that on, on the OSC Workshops Facebook page as well. But a fellow from... Uh, Romania, and his name is, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, the name is escaping me. Our new Romanian friend, look at the, the OSC workshops posting there. But yeah, he's working on, on a, pretty much a novel university type system where it's, it's very much aligned with the kind of stuff we do. So hopefully we might collaborate on the actual education part because uh, he's been doing, he basically started up like a university run by the students in Romania uh, with very good successes to the point that he's actually writing a book right now. So he's he's publishing uh, that right now. But yeah, very interesting, I, I, interesting work there. Uh, okay, okay. So next, who uh, who else has anything to report? I, I can start my bit. Uh, anyone else? This is Jennifer. I reached out to the IDEA homeschool program. I haven't heard back from them yet. And I um, sent a bunch of links and uh, um, ended up having to contact them on Facebook, funnily enough. Um, and uh, an invitation to have as many of their people, you know, their homeschoolers um, join the project. And I found an open source hackathon that I think is a regular event um, at the end of January. And I'm just going to like show up and participate and see if I can network a little bit there. Uh, any specific topic for that hackathon or it's uh, pretty open? I don't know. It's at North Seattle Community College. And I know that, um, that they do have open source hackathons there. There's no topic that's published. So if we had, um, if we had something you know, like it, it's only got a couple hours allotted to it, so I don't really know how much hacking they're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, but we might be able to go in with a small project. Look, I'm looking at my calendar real fast to try to figure out what date it is. It should be um, oh, on, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to look at my calendar. Yeah. But um. Yep. I think it's next week. Anyway, that's all I got. Okay. Sounds good. So thank you. Um, Abe, how about yourself? Any updates? Yes. Uh, I was just working on the, uh, the D3D PVC mini assembly to try to get that a little bit closer to finished. So I don't want to leave too many things hanging, but I've been working on, uh, well, a number of things. So 
Uh, I think I got that. I just worked on it to get the clamp to a point where the measurement works out so that I think all the axes are equal. Uh, so the yeah. rods, for the, all three axes are equal and they should fit together, together pretty well. The clamp has to be a little bit bigger to kind of space things out, but I think that's fine. I mean, the clamp can be printed uh, right away with whatever ideal print settings, you know, are needed. It, it makes it a little bigger, but I made it uh, longer in the direction that it needed to be and in, in not in the other direction. So it's shaped a little different, but uh, I think that that works. I'm gonna have to look at it and check some things, but I've looked at measurements and everything, and I think everything lines up. All the axes bolt on, and and I think that's pretty good there. Uh, although there's a lot of other little details, I kept having to add. Um, well, I added the more detailed axes instead of using the simple ones because I keep having to figure out measurements. There's a bunch of stuff because of the size of the frame and the thickness and the way everything assembles around it. You, you have to be able to position it so that all the oddities don't don't hit. Or um, I think there's some things to check, like the uh, the magnetic holder attachments. You have to make sure that those don't bump up against the frame or something. Things like that have to be checked. But uh, that that shouldn't be too hard. I think I've got it spaced out pretty good. But I, I'll just have to keep checking some of the details. Uh, and I think the arrangement is okay. I've arranged it like some of the others I saw with the motors and a lot of the weight is all to one side that way. But I, I think that that's better for certain reasons. I think there's reasons why that was done. So um, that, I mean, it does make it weight imbalanced, but um, uh, I think the way that it moves, I think that's ideal. Uh, and I, I don't know the print volume. I don't know what exactly that is, but I think it's it's pretty good. And there's a bunch of reasons that it's not, you know, the full, full volume of the cube. You can't hardly get it that way. But I think I think I've got it so that that's the maximum volume. But um, there there could be other ways to arrange it. But it's um, you have to kind of figure out all the math on all that. So it's a little bit tedious in that manner. But I, I think I got it. The way I did it is the way that it'll give the largest area, I think. Uh, but if anybody sees anything else with it, um, that would be interesting. Um, oh, I see you're looking for the wiki. I, I haven't pushed, um, let's see, the latest. I need to upload the parts to the wiki. I pushed them to uh, the GitLab because I just I just updated it a while ago. I worked okay. on it a little bit before the meeting. And um, let's see, yeah, I need to update the clamp to the wiki because I I think it's. I think it's. Is this the latest clamp that I'm showing, or no? No, no. no so, no. Uh, yeah, it'll be on the GitLab link. I, I did put that link on my. I just put it to my uh, log, and it, it's also in the 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 link in the uh work in the meeting document. Uh, has the files, so I just pushed those. Um, yeah, it's a different. It it looks like what's in the image in the working doc too. So, um. Yeah, I think that's a good size and shape for the wow. clamp seen there. But uh, wow. yeah, so, I'm gonna have to update the wiki because I think I think they are good good parts, and I think that assembly is pretty close. So, but I'll, I'll try to assemble huh. more things and um, yeah, add whatever parts I need to check the check to see that there's clearances on the magnetic holders. Uh, there's some extra parts in there because I was just checking to see the, the movement and where things might hit the frame, like the Z axis. Uh, I think it clears the clamps and stuff. I was trying to see where clearances were and so on, mm -hmm. because there's always the chance that uh, something hits at a certain point where there's no uh, limit switch, I guess, but um, right. so it's, important to make sure it clears. Although, well, actually on the, hmm, yeah, on the Z act might hit, now that I'm looking at it again, I may have adjusted something and now it looks like it, the top of the, the bed uh, holder might hit uh, that top clamp on the curved part, but hmm, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'll have to think about that, so. Yeah, those are, um pretty sizable there so the way you've got it yeah 
Uh, so when you attach, is one bolt going all the way through to clamp both the clamp, the piece onto the clamp, or there's two bolts and a nut catcher inside? So there's uh, yeah, there's still some design to do on the um, yeah on the clamp. I guess I need to add some recesses for the bolts maybe to hold those. Yeah. But um, there's two bolts, and one of them goes through. It has to go the full length of the uh, clamp and, and, and the axis, which, yeah, I think we were talking before about the length of the bolts was an issue. So th that's an issue with, I guess, the depth. I think it was 30 millimeters, I think we talked about before. So yeah. I'll have to measure that and see if the recess for the bolt uh, or the, the nut catcher, uh, what the depth of that can be. Because, uh, yeah, if they're all... Hmm. Yeah, the issue there is that they'd be different lengths too, because there's two different, yeah, bolt holes. But I, I assume there's different bolts mm -hmm. used in the supply. I think that look before there's 30 millimeter, and then maybe there's 20 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, there's 18 and, and 30. Hopefully, the common 18. sizes can be made to work. Yeah. Or if it's or if it's shorter, then the the nut catcher can be recessed further and things like that. Uh, at least in mm, parts of the clamp. Uh, although the, the where the axis bolts through the clamp, that that's kind of hard to recess much there on that side. But um, hmm, yeah, if the shape needs to be adjusted a little more, that that could happen. Uh, mm -hmm. To look at the shape of it in general, but. Um, yeah, I reshaped it a bit, but it, yeah, yeah, it might I don't know how, I hope that's fairly printable, too. I'm going to have to add the nut catcher recesses yet uh, again, which I think I had before, but I kept adjusting it, so I left those out this time. But it got larger in the direction of the bolts for the axis just to make it, uh, to space it out so that the the 14, what is it, 14 point, it's almost 14 and a half inches for the rods and the axes, uh, the outside. So the is it the x axis, x axis between the y axis uh, almost, you know, it just it reaches across. And so that's why I had to make those uh, clamps bigger just to make it uh, work out to the same length. Clamp bigger? No, you're trying to land. Yeah, I see what you what you're yeah. doing. Um, I would probably suggest that that we might have to give up that requirement and and work with. Well, it's probably that, better to have the clamps optimized. No, or right now it is close to 14 and a half inches. They're all they're all equal. I mean that that where uh -huh. that works out. I mean right now, if if we don't okay. mind the clamps being that size. They're they're equal. They reach. I mean, there's yeah, yeah. like a point zero 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 two discrepancy. I think in the distance between the x and the y, whatever that is. But that's negligible. Um, I don't think that causes any issues. I measured it so that yeah, I adjusted the clamp by like point six inches or some fraction just to make it work out. So as long as the print comes out. I think I think that PLA shrinks a little, so I you know there's always the possibility of needing to uh, adjust that more for exact printing. But the, I assume that that's somewhat negligible, uh, as long as it doesn't cause uh, the assembly to be difficult or uh, in a bind or something. It should be fine. Do you think that? The You think the clamps can be made small? Why? Length of the axes, or no? That's you have to achieve that. Let's see. I, I think you're cutting out a little bit. Are you saying? Yeah. You say that can the clamps be made smaller? Yes. Then that um, probably not much. Um, let's say change some major arrangement. I think there's other possible configurations that lower the print volume. Um, but the, the length of the, the clamp and the bolt direction is where I lengthened it 
they're pretty close in the length around the um in the other direction i made the, the you know the sides as close to the bolt holes as possible i think I, I, that, but maybe there's room to tweak that down i mean i assume that for the bulk of the length of that you know you just print with really low infill or something i assume whatever you, know, you just have to optimize the plastic i hope that doesn't the clamp being a little bit bulkier i assume they don't need a lot of strength in some ways um so i assume can be printed with low infill. I don't know what the current infill is for the uh, the access parts, but I assume it's kind of low. I, I don't know if they, they probably don't need much compressive strength or no um, in the either direction. It, I mean, the whole yeah. frame is plastic, so you yeah. know the the flexibility is is the issue there, uh, and not, probably less so, the strength of the clamp. Right. Um. So as a summary on that point, if you were to make the clamp smaller, because you we do see some kind of like potential interference issues, if you were to make it smaller, then the axes would no longer be equal. Is that the idea? I, th I think that there's different ways you could you can make the axes a much, I think a shorter length, and that just reduces the print volume. I was trying to maximize that. Um, I think that the the next sort of size down, if they're made smaller and they're made, uh, like if you turn the clamps so that the, the bolt holes line up different, like if the clamps are turned um, kind of in towards each other so that the, the next smaller size would be quite a bit shorter and it would reduce the print volume. In other words, the clamps kind of right now, they're kind of turned in a, in a symmetry. So... Like on the z-axis the bolt is on top and then above the frame the it's bolted on top above the frame both at the bottom and the top if they were turned um i think kind of um in a different symmetry towards each other so they're shorter it, it's um two or three inches shorter and i think that ends up reducing the z-axis and the other axes um qu quite a bit i think let's see the distance on what is it? Two two point six inches on the clamp one way and two inches the other, but it's I think it's somewhat the the distance between the bolt holes on the axes. So if it bolts through, say at the top of uh, well, I, yeah, I guess it could bolt at the top of the uh, motor mount. Uh, instead of at the bottom. So it would be that much shorter. I think that's like two or so inches. I can't remember. And so it ends up uh, aligning with the shorter distance, but I think you end up with quite a bit of less volume. Uh -huh. So mainly you, in the Z direction, I think. Would you summarize it that then the issue for doing that is not that you can't but the volume will be reduced. Yeah, the volume looks pretty low once you do that. I mean, I, I don't know if it's six inches or I can't remember at the moment. I think I kind of estimated that out. But yeah, a six inch cube volume, I guess, is not terrible for a small printer. Probably better to have it, you know. in the Z axis, I figure, is one that's potentially more important. In some ways, maybe mm -hmm. I, the bed is always frame right uh, now. Is, that I, is the rods? Are we talking about rods being right now fourteen inches in the frame being twelve inches? Yeah. So the, On the yeah, I, yeah, duck with the original yeah. frame shape, which is about twelve yeah. inches, and uh, yeah, fourteen, almost fourteen and a half uh, for the rod length, which think works yeah. out um, well, that's pretty easy to cut yeah indeed um pretty cool so interesting part about this is you take yourself some pvc pipe you cut it you you can print the corners you can print the connectors you can print most of what you see there except for the rods and so that's that's pretty cool so yeah good work good work um 
keep going at it as soon as you think you got the final thing let's just print it up print it out see if we can make this frame work and how stable it is um definitely a worthwhile idea because going on remote workshops uh the carrying the metal is heavy the metal is heavy about 20 pounds per machine so uh having just lightweight pvc components and then sourcing say pvc pipe locally so we go traveling to do a workshop that would be easy thing to do yeah. thank you uh hey but what else uh you've got some more stuff on uh, no. oh. yeah i think we've been keeping up on the uh the press code i i think that's pretty good i um we kind of emailed some back more for about that i think i guess you've been testing the, yeah, the no. power cubes and maybe you have some updates on that i mean i think we know where we're at on the code it's uh pretty good i think but i i, I read some of what you were testing but um I, may need to have a better understanding of that okay. but so let me uh, maybe take this time to i'll cut in then to continue where you left off uh, facebook here and so clean sharing the screen right now all right you guys can see my face so i'll talk about a couple of things um so uh first comment is power cube modularity uh this, this is our tractor right now it's pretty cold here today. It's 17 and negative 12 at night Fahrenheit that is But that's what we're doing with so the The weak link about the tractor is power cubes like right now. We're just using uh, Briggs and Stratton engines, which are pretty much disposable. Uh, I mean they don't work for a long time uh, I think the solution that I, I, I re Recently got pretty excited about is actually things like the Changfa diesel. It's a one-cylinder diesel up to 27 horsepower it's like the Lister engine, but the tighter, higher power version of that. Lister's being historically very robust. Um, diesel engines, basically, uh, historically speaking, they were used quite a bit. And today you talk about more advanced diesel engines, but what's the solution for OSE for the long term? Well, on one side we have modern steam engines, which I do believe there's a lot of hope for that. But if we want raw power, like right now, um one solution is to make the briggs and strattons more replaceable and a second is immediate solution is to go to things like the changfa diesels which i think a great are a great candidate for an engine to actually open source meaning that you're actually milling out all the parts for a simple diesel engine or the hardest part to make would probably be the diesel pump okay but with what i have here on, on hand this is what i did recently so i, I had to replace a power cube because the power cube went out it started firing on one cylinder so th there you go uh took the hoist to the tractor remove this is this is hard work i just did that myself so that was hard work but with a hoist it's doable you can take this the power cube weighs about 600 pounds probably well maybe not maybe like 500 or so uh, heavy frame around it, but next we talked about there's a page on the wiki that summarizes it called power cube modularity uh, I think a good direction for the future With micro track and big tractors and everything else would be to go with one module That's just got the hydraulics hoses cooler filter everything hydraulic and the second small mo module that plugs into that is just engine with pump so think about the just engine and pump being easily swappable so you have one mother cube that's got the hydraulic reservoir and everything related to hydraulics, including cooler, and then as many other engine cubes as you like connected to that. So that's kind of, I think that could work with one. So you need one hydraulic reservoir, hydraulic power cube, and then you can connect to that as many additional power cubes as you like. So that might be a, a good thing to go forward with. Um, and as we go into the future with the micro track micro track is very near product release i mean if you go to i mean look at the wiki page called uh, micro track v1710 so the last build was in june uh, october of 2017 but it's great um works well and some minor refinements need to be made such as uh, maybe hose routing because you see the hoses are all over the place but that's a good deal and the other thing that could be low-hanging fruit in terms of 
immediate release is if you look at the bigger tractor, the one we use right now, that's still from like 2013, uh, years of use on that uh, and testing. Uh, it's an articulated version, but a simple low-hanging fruit version of a tractor to do right now is a skid steer type. And if we go into the future for a product release, if you think about uh, economic feedback loops, I think the micro track as well as a skid steering type of a tractor are two low hanging fruits. Uh, the track versions are more powerful and a little farther away, but that's a comment worth making with respect to the modular power cube where you have one hydraulic unit and as many of the, the engine units as you like. And now the engines are only 18 horsepower. So we're talking about a $300 18 horsepower engine. The Briggs and Stratton look alike. Right now we're use, using, it's called Duromax. And that's what you see, the blue thing inside the micro track. Um, the blue, there, that's the blue engine. 18 horsepower or 16 horsepower Duromax. Um, given that, I just wanted one bring up one update related to the small uh, hydraulic vehicles. I talked to Katarina here. And she convinced me that it would be worthwhile to do a golf cart like structure. And I thought about that. It's like, well, golf carts are for like golf. <laughs> what does that have to do with modern civilization? Well, Katrina made a claim that it would really make life easier carrying stuff around and doing a lot of utility work. Because a lot of life, if you're around a resource based uh, scenario, is materials movement and moving yourself, moving. Uh, whatever soil garden work materials moving is a big parts and a golf cart could be useful so let's think about this what about um, a simple skid steering golf cart kind of a thing with the same small power cube and Katrina convinced me that that would be worth worthwhile so we'll take a look at doing that I looked at the hydraulic motors from surplus center that could do that if you go to surpluscenter.com the, the kind of motors that you want for that relatively decent so you could have a four-wheel drive kind of a hydraulic uh, golf cart kind of a deal and if you go to hydraulics motors those motors cost about 150 quite they're low speed high torque hydraulic motors at, at surplus center so you look at yeah rather not that it's wheel motors uh, go to this there's actually and the smallest ones there they got like 3.6 cubic inch which is just about right for direct wheel drive on a thing like a golf cart 150 dollars each if we make it four wheel drive that's 600 dollars in motors and then you use our existing power cube and a base platform and there you go so that's just one idea that came about just for an update now another thing is uh i am spending some time working on a book and and i looked at solar solar cars right so you might say oh well that's not possible so let's go to the page on the wiki called book solar cars let's look at some numbers so let's take the size of a typical car solar car the car is about six by 16 feet so the question is if you took that that base area how many solar panels can you fit on that and I said, okay, well, let's take it eight feet wide. That's still street legal and the same length as a car, eight by 16 feet. You fit a thousand watts of, of lightweight, um, flexible solar panels, which you, which you can get on Amazon for $100 for 100 watts, so about a dollar a watt. Okay, that's great. So let's take a look at some calculations for what a car, a solar car would look like. Is it feasible at all? Um, there's a useful thing called cycling power and speed calculator, which tells you based on how much power and how and what kind of wheels, because the main drag is going to be your wheels on the ground and your wind resistance. So based on a frontal area, some, and then you declare, okay, what are your wheels like? Like, say it's got mountain bike type wheels, a frontal area of so, so and so. Uh, you get some results so if you click on a cycling power speed calculator you ask yourself what do you get with a thousand watts that you can put on a solar car so you, sh you should actually uh convince yourself just go to that page um gribble.org cycling power calculator um the conclusions are that uh certain parameters 
parameters like a 300 pound vehicle with if you have 500 watts of power you're going 35 miles per hour now uh, can you optimize that so that's not bad think about this you've got a thousand dollars worth of solar panels on a on a car a very lightweight car like like sun race like the solar race cars that they do in australia with college uh, college competitions that kind of car with 500 watts of solar which i think could be easy on an average day in missouri let's say so you got a thousand watts of panels but they're not angled properly and you know that's max power for a thousand watts let's say you get 50 percent of the max so 500 watts easily you would get on a sunny day that gets you 35 miles per hour not bad uh so what's the feasibility of a solar car well for a vehicle that's like gets you around on a sunny day 35 miles per hour is not bad at all now you can actually optimize and calculate it and, and try to convince you that okay so i'm going to take a let's go through some specific numbers weight of a driver is 165 pounds that's actually my weight uh the vehicle itself weighs 300 pounds each solar panel weighs, weighs four pounds so four times ten is 40 pounds in in panels and then 260 pounds of rest of the vehicle weight with electric motors, et cetera. Frontal area, let's make it like eight square feet. Uh, coefficient of drag. If you look at coefficient of drag, an air for, like the most efficient cars are 0.2. Um, if you Google what's the most efficient drag coefficient of a car, meaning how aerodynamic it is, it would be like 0.2. Now the airfoil shape, is point less than point 0.1 like a wing shape but let's take point 0.1 which is point 0.2 which is what we can easily get because that's what the most aerodynamic cars can get we could definitely do that um and then coefficient of rolling resistance is the only other main parameter we need to know there and point oh zero zero five is that for like racing bike wheels let's say mountain bike wheels are point zero one because that's if you do this what you get so we've got 465 pound vehicle weight with the driver, uh, 0 0.01 res uh, resistance of r rolling, and the coefficient of drag turns out to be the biggest affecting factor because the wheels were pretty good. We can do 0 0.01 wheels on the coefficient of rolling resistance. And then the drag is, I found just playing with this, that the drag is the biggest effect on how how fast you're going to go for a given power. Because we're talking about a solar car. Uh, not a lot of power, kilowatt. Coefficient of drag, 0.2. You get, you type that down there, sulfur specific power and speed. So say you got 500 watts, which we will have um, at high noon in Missouri. At least, we probably would get like 750 maybe. So let's say 500 watts per conservative, you get 29 miles per hour. That's not really bad. Um, you can possibly think of decreasing this with like the front surface area. So it turns out it doesn't change much. Like if you change that to four, 500 watts gets you about 34 miles per hour. I think eight, they'll be safe. Eight would be safe. That's easy to do. But I think we can get that coefficient of drag. Like what if we get it to down to point one, like an airfoil shape, super aerodynamic, like velo car, vel like velomobiles, kind of like that, but even, yeah, something like that. If you can get the drag coefficient down to point one, like an airfoil, 500 watts would get you... It says 35 miles per hour. Wow. So that's with 500 watts of power. And so, so basically the argument I'm trying to make here, if you got 500 watts of power from a solar car, by that in itself, you can go like 35 miles per hour optimally. So it's worth trying. And, and this thing of solar cars might not be a bad idea, but think telescoping body on that car. So you, some more panels would slide out um so you could say get 50 percent more power uh, maybe you get that all up to a thousand watts of power well you're talking about 50 miles per hour at that point so you know think about it maybe maybe solar cars could be feasible and this is just getting off the shelf current pv panels 
Uh, it's a thought that that should be considered because if you look at the numbers, like the first principle calculations get you pretty positive results for solar cars. Now, grant the sun race, the solar car race across Australia, those things go 55 miles per hour just on solar power. So, you know, might be worth considering. Now, the cheating route to do there is to put a one kilowatt Honda generator, put that on board, and then still have that extra 500 watts of your solar panels. So, you know, one of those Honda one kilowatt silent generators? Well, if you have 1500 watts of power, wow, you go 60 miles per hour. So <laughs> these hybrid <laughs> solar cars could be a pretty attractive option. Like if you have a very small generator on board with you to uh, augment the solar power, I don't see why that is not completely practical uh, transportation that would get you hundreds of miles per gallon equivalent. So some solar, some liquid fuels. Okay, let's see enough on that. Um, I just want to put up as- I posted, Martin? Yeah. I posted the yeah. link. I think there is a some German company who also make. Oh no, uh, they want to create a electric oh. car, and they also put some solar panels on it. Oh, cool! Electric, sonoma, sonoma. Yeah, is that the one? Yes. First mass produced electric car can charge 16,000 euros. So I would make the claim that this kind of solar, well, fully solar, solar charged, or more like the Sunray style, very or uh, building there that's pursuing. So um, uh, the point about the what I described as the eight by sixteen solar race type of car with a thousand dollars worth of panels. I mean the cost is not super prohibitive it would be like probably around four thousand dollars three or four thousand dollars um so solar cars why not oh i, I think uh, um yeah I, I don't think about this particular car um i'm not sure if it's a good idea to put a solar panels on the car because if you put a car and the direct uh, sun, uh, then it will uh, it, uh, warm up, and then you need to waste energy to cool down on the inside of the car. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, the thermal considerations are there too. Uh, for what I'm thinking here, actually, I, I thought about that, and it's like the obvious place is okay, you put the solar panels on a roof. But what about if the solar panels are low lying and the cab is actually like like in a Formula One car, the car kind of uh, the cab rises off like a base. So yeah, um, but you do have to consider thermal thermal constraints too. Like one, for example, one comment I read about for the super super uh, aerodynamic cars with like a bubble for the operator. Well, that's a good solar cooker for the operator in the summer. So <laughs> you definitely have to pay attention. Yes, um, but, but uh, it's a good uh, idea, good direction. And uh, there are also, um, there are still a possibility to use uh, solar panels for some robotic or autonomous vehicles. Right, where speed does not matter and you can go very slow. And also, there is no uh, human operator inside, and it could heat up or probably without uh, big um, disadvantages. Yeah. For, for the future, maybe Absolutely some agriculture agreed. machines um, or that's, that's even good. transportation without uh, autonomous transportation. Oh, sorry, what about transportation? Uh, maybe uh, in the future you, you can use uh, these sm small solar cars to transport stuff but without the uh, actual driver, human driver. Oh, well, well that's, that's exactly it. In cases where speed does not matter, or you the fact that you have a perfectly functioning car that goes 25 miles per hour, I mean, with yes. autonomous... 
yeah, that is completely feasible where that now you have like this transportation grid that's autonomous and 100% and solar. So that's you can s send some packages to, yeah. to your neighbors. Just put Absolutely. I mean, that's already happening. There's already companies that have autonomous vehicles, but not solar. I don't think any of them are solar. Uh, but yeah, that's it's just going to happen in the future. I hope not, because if uh, now this idea will be published and no one is allowed to patent it. <laughs> I already recorded this video on a wiki, so it can be patented. Yes, just, just make everything public. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Keep it public, and and we we don't have to worry about things getting sucked up by the man. Yes. Okay. But let's go to a very much more mundane topic, and that's I want to report on the brick press testing because actually I am um, right now in a freezing cold, testing the code for the brick press. So here's the mechanical, uh, the hydraulic system with solenoid valves. Some details about it. Um, Let's see, just to go through some of the pictures here and learning. So yeah, overview of the whole system. So here's the pressure gauge on this. So in this picture here, I'll, I'll just show this. This is actually building this. Uh, here you have the inlet with a quick coupler. The, fluid flows through the system here and then that's the outlet quick coupler here so you turn these solenoid valves are electrically controlled by arduino and they control the cylinders in the brick press uh, here we have the pressure gauge and that takes two signals from the arduino to measure pressure when it's high here's a pressure gauge to show where you are at pressure we are running about 2500 psi here's a bypass valve if you have uh an, a high pressure event the fluid can bypass so it's a safety feature um, but I do want to report on a code so we were uh, Abe and I are kind of working on a code in the background there but um, yeah Cause the learnings are that yes the routines are working uh, just subtle details like the idea that when you measure pressure you have to debounce the signal. Uh, debounce is a concept where, where you have to measure a signal twice just to verify that the reading is correct. And that's typically done with when you turn things on and off because you might get weird signals if you don't, because the microprocessor measure things so fast that if you do a point measurement, it might be a transient event. So you measure that twice. Now, the practical ramification for that twice measurement called debounce, debouncing that signal is that there's a little delay. And in the loop, uh, the Arduino code, because the, the loops run really fast, they probably run like a million times a second for the control code loop. So you, the thing that I learned, and I just had to shake this down, but one thing you got to do is um, the code correction in there is you have to put a delay between the steps that is longer than the debounce time so i had to add that to the code to make it work properly but right now it's working and continue to shake that down got some video not really i didn't take video of the machine running um so continuing with that if you want to take a look at what that code looks like the the work work document still kind of represents this pretty closely so here you see the design in the concept and what you saw there were the actual real parts in real life um but this very simple system of the simple Arduino with a single solenoid relay relay shield and a few connections and a selector for brick thickness. Yeah, that's all you need. It's very simple, much simpler than the controllers from years before, which had dedicated boards. So this is working. And um, I guess kind of like the latest, I think we'll pr pretty much will stick with this because it's accessible anywhere. And Read, ready to be built by off-shelf Amazon components. So pretty easy. Um, no, there, Abe, there is no bouncing. That Those readings are fine. Uh, but the thing was, which kept confusing me, because uh, what happened was I tested the code to test, OK, so let's bounce the 
uh, move the cylinder back and forth when it, until it hits high pressure. That means that's the reverse direction. What happened is it looked like it worked, but sometimes it would bounce like twice. I was like, what's going on there? And it, was, it wasn't the debounce. It was actually the fact that you need a simple delay loop. Like if the debounce time is 20, 20 milliseconds, you might do a delay between one direction motion and other direction motion by more than 20. So I did like fifth. I actually tried debounce time of 50 milliseconds and a delay time of 100 milliseconds. I'm going to work those down probably to like 20 and 30 just to... I was just making sure it worked. Okay. They, Going from, yeah. If it needs to be right. longer, that's always a thing. And there are ways to do it, uh, certain timing things without the delay, if necessary, in certain parts of the code. Because I know the, the delay, um, obviously, it, it holds up the processor. It, it stays within the, the delay function. It's kind of a loop. But I think the way that the machine works, the delays are okay because you don't need to do anything simultaneously. Um, yeah. Usually. The so, delay is not a problem. Yeah. As long as the delay is under a second, because 100 milliseconds is, is perfectly fine. But if you're pressing, so the, the real figures are five bricks per minute, oh. five, six, seven bricks per minute. Well, if your delay is gets to the point of like being one second, every cycle, pressing cycle has maybe like five or so pieces of motion. So if you had a five seconds delay every cycle, that starts adding up, right? So that's wasting a lot of time. So if it's 0.1 second or under, you're not wasting time. The, the question is simply how much dead time do you have in the whole process? Yeah, I mean, so obviously the main under, delay is the delays in there are really when the machine, the bigger ones are when it's operating because that's how it's actually being timed. Well, the delay is until the pressure is reached, I guess, usually. So, yeah, um, it, it, I mean, it works okay that way, I think, with those delays. And I, I didn't think the 20 milliseconds was significant, but if it needs to be 100, eh, that, that doesn't seem like no, a lot. No, I think 20 milliseconds is good, but since I was still shaking it down, I was seeing some weird stuff. I think 20, second, 20 milliseconds is perfectly fine. Now There are the, other ways to debounce, too, that would maybe take uh, more or less time, or you could check multiple times. Are there other little algorithms that, that do it different ways? They, that they exist. You can find them all over the web because sometimes those switches and things, they're, they're just harder. Certain types are harder to debounce, or some switches... Right more problematic as they age, especially those tactile buttons. And, and I don't know about the noise on the other switch. Sometimes you, if it's a problem with the bouncing, which it doesn't sound like it is too much, sometimes you really need to put a scope on it, look what it, see what it looks like and, and pick the right algorithm. But I would think that'd be too much of a, an issue there. Um, if it needs to be debounced, um, you know, a third time, or something like that, another 20, 50 milliseconds or something, that sometimes can be uh, better, just average it out more. Yeah, um, we're okay there. But the surprise for me was um, actually, you know, the code from 1708, the way it was written, uh, we had to add those delays. The bottom line being, um, so here's the explanation, and this is kind of tricky, you have to, it was actually a learning for me because I thought we had it bagged. So you do the debounce, you do the measurement, right? As soon as that measurement is made, um, it's about the time when that, nah, it's kind of, I don't know if I can even explain it, but, but that time when it's waiting for the second measurement, uh, if you're not careful within the loop itself, it's actually going to the next command in line. Um, that seems like that's what it should do. But hmm. if, yeah, the point is, if you don't wait until that 20 milliseconds pass, you can skip a step in the control sequence because the condition of low pressure is when you move cylinders is not met. 
So this it's it's actually a little, little subtle, oh. but bottom line being that you need to add a, like a small delay between steps to make the code work. Hmm. Okay. Well, maybe there's there could be a different logic or hmm, function or there's, something. Okay. My, so Abe, there's my, different logics we can we can use, and that's that made me think. Well, maybe that's why like when we did the code, because I know Zach and other people when we did the. I know when Zach did it, he had a bunch of case statements and a little bit more complicated Arduino construction. In this thing, all we tried to do, like, because I want to have any user be able to modify this code. So all we're doing is sense sensor move cylinder. Like, no funky loop constructions like case in case of this or that. Like, you can get advanced with the code syntax, which is so-called the proper way to go but you can also make it very simple where you, it's very linear and structured very simply namely detect and move like no no special constructions of case statements and blah 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 um so by keeping the code very simple we can still make it very simple but we just have to put this little delay in there which is still very simple for a user because just delay 50 you know delay 50 milliseconds so okay there's different ways to do it, but we're trying to, the goal for us yeah. is to keep it so simple that a novice user can actually look at the code and understand it just by looking at it. And yeah, then um, because the definition is basically commands there can be different. Say it again? I think the, de the definition of simplicity is going to vary. So I think it seems okay with the if then yeah. branches and all that. And when I looked at, kept looking at maybe some case statements or some other functions that would return numbers and then it would, uh, do the, the different steps by, by number and stuff. I, I tried some code to look at other ways to do it in it. It didn't really simplify or shorten the code that much overall. Um, mm -hmm. I, and yeah. because, because the steps and different things are so unique, there really isn't a lot of options to write it or make functions that are, um, you know, that reduce the complexity. So it, when you yeah. have a lot of, Steps, you just have to write code for each one, and that's why we have all those yeah. if-else branches. But um, yeah, I, I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's ways to write. I guess w one way to say it is to write it modular and keep the loop real simple and write it so people don't have to understand some of the other functions and things. Uh, that can be done more, but um because most people if you write lots of simple functions if that's necessary then people don't necessarily have to know as much how the functions work and they can just reuse them in the uh the loop or just adjust the numbers right. and things like that because that's really all anybody needs to change it's not like the logic of the steps is really going to be changed that different right. it just can't it's the order of operations so yeah 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 that's right that's right so we're keeping the code basically very transparent right now and things like that. So, um, I think that's about it. So you wanna, wanna add anything else? Uh, any, uh, we start to talk about the power cube modularity uh, and I started the page in the wiki about that. Um, I think related to some of this stuff, simplifying it and be able to make um, some of these these golf cart vehicles and so on, making some of these things lighter or simpler, I think it goes back to kind of needing the, uh, the torch table and stuff like that. Yes. At least do it Indeed. easily. That way you don't have so much prep for workshops and things like that. If the machine can cut it all, and you know, use thinner, lighter metals at the top to keep the the um, center of gravity lower on the vehicles, tractors, and so on. Um, that should help with yeah, that. That's, so. Yeah, I agree on that. So yeah, get all these designs out there with a torch table. You can prepare the materials really easily. Uh, thinking about the the economics of that. Uh, golf cart is very simple because it doesn't have like all the hydraulics like lifting arms and all that so that so done in a workshop scenario I could very easily see that you host a workshop we cut all the parts order materials you build several of these things over a weekend or I mean so basically be a day for the power cube if, you, if we're using the power cube 
and a day for the rest. It's it's very simple. I mean, we've built um, when we did that 54 horsepower tractor for the nut planting here. We did that uh, was I think it was one day with four guys. So we really it's it goes fast once you know how to do it and got the parts that are ready to assemble. Yeah, I could see some kind of electric yep. cart being pop, pretty popular because um, I always see these. I don't have I don't have ATVs here, but um, the the ATV kind of golf cart things that are a little heavier. They're popular with with farmers and stuff. They use them for a lot of things. Some of those, yeah. I don't think you can pull a lot with them, but they're they're kind of a useful class of of vehicle uh, just for farm stuff. Cross over utility vehicle, they call it. Something a little heavier is probably useful that moves, you know pretty fast, but uh, can still pull a little more than like a four wheeler might be able to. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It is low hanging fruit, but I didn't really think about it because I haven't been thinking along the lines of slow vehicles kind of like those since they didn't appear to be central to a new civilization, <laughs> but they may be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think like Jenna was saying, cars should be just less important in the future. There's so much uh, automation and if cities are redesigned correctly, they're, they're already oh, yeah. popular there. Yeah. So cars are, are, you know, they're kind of less of an issue. So yeah, it's true. Other transport. Um, Mar Marchin, uh I had a question about the uh, status of the uh, fellowship. Yep. Um, just just uh, <laughs> um, I, I I heard from Alex that um, it may be on hiatus. Uh, Go ahead. Just, yeah, just just kind of wondering um, where 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 it stands. What what's that? Sorry. Oh. The, the, about the fellowship, Nathan, was this again? Can, yeah, can, uh, can you hear me now? Okay, um, I had a question about the the status of the fellowship. Um, I heard from yeah. Alex that it might be on hiatus. What do you? Oh yeah, about? right. So so last, oh yeah, the update on the fellowship material is um, so with the three D printer workshop. As far as Alex and Sarah who joined the team. I mean, couldn't keep them. We we weren't uh, getting people to sign up. It it's, turns out it's a lot of work to train somebody to do that and get them all up to speed. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the direction on that, what I'm doing right now is okay. So getting the printer to a robust model where we we have to do it again and and do it once, I can show reliably that okay we can do workshops, populate them on a regular you know on a regular schedule mm -hmm. do um, also the teacher training for osc clubs and 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 the professional education training where uh there's simply a, a revenue model that's proven and worked out for for a regular basis because to date our workshops have been somewhat irregular mm -hmm. um and we're really still trying to nail that as far as a, a an economic model that that can really pull through so mm -hmm. still working on it and we do want to train people as i mean as soon as we find we've got it to the full way um, yeah. that's when we can start it again but right now it's too much stuff in front still i mean still some missing missing links to that i okay. think part of the the keys to success there would be also uh having the larger printer developed like the meter scale printer because that is such a much more powerful product in terms of one it's you can charge more money for it and there's not a lot of people making those and we're in a pretty good position to be making those because our system is scalable so that's yeah. one but also the other part of the film and maker infrastructure which mm -hmm. is still not at a hundred percent i mean we're okay. still working on that while we have shown it the stuff we don't we don't have anything like commercial like until we get to the point where we can reliably make filament that we can sell, uh, we're not really there yet. So, so I think a couple of elements are missing, but okay. still.
still working on those, and and that is a priority because uh, the 3D printer and the education around that for STEM, you know, for schools, for getting kids involved and getting people prototyping, like we talked about scale models last meeting, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's still as low hanging fruit. And and print, 3D printers are not going away; they're getting better and more capacity. So that's still high priority. Got it. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's where we are, are there. Um, okay, so let's um, let's call this meeting now. It's uh, three ten, and it's yeah. I'm reading Abe's comment. It does seem small missing pieces do hold up the business side of things, and and that's and that's absolutely true. And I think the learning is we're just finding out that you know you can have a product but to go from from product or a working say working product to productization or marketing and, and the actual enterprise aspect man totally different story it's like i would say that okay yeah you can have that product like at the state where say the 3d printer is right now or the brick press is but to do that to do a viable enterprise it's like it seems like 10 times more work because you got to have all these other assets in place. Um, so it's true. The learnings are to take a product from something that works as a prototype uh, to a full commercial release is huge. I actually wrote a page about this. It's called the stages of uh, product release, I think it's called. I know, Wiki, let's just maybe wrap up with that. Stages of product release. Let's see if that uh, comes up. March thinking about this and it's like man yes this is just so synchronistic i am going to a seminar wednesday night called navigating the stages of building a hardware company right that's the deal so stages so see the page called the stages of product release Con so there's 11. i put down 11. first is concept second is prototype now you got to get into the, the partial releases like pre-alpha, alpha, beta, and release. So pre-alpha is free, feature complete, alpha is feature complete and actually rep, replicated in-house. Beta is where you feature it's feature complete and you freeze the features, don't add anything more, so you can get a release where it's released for consumption. For consumption, it's not commercial yet. I would say pilot is where you actually test that you can replicate it in, a, in an significant way because what we're finding out is that we can release stuff and nobody replicates it as a business we can you know we are starting to show that we can make money and support ourselves doing it but then others can so pilots would show that others can also do economic significant work from it then you get into production engineering that's when you're uh, developing the efficient production um, where it's not good enough to do so for you to be able to build one you have to consider okay how do you build one or another one tomorrow another one the day after regular production so that means you have to optimize everything and get very uh, refined ways to do that that's the production engineering phase and i can say we're at the production engineering phase with the 3d printer i would say because we're working out how to deliver kits effectively on a regular basis and how to deliver workshops on a regular basis then you can have something like franchise license white label development what's that uh franchises one um like the, our licenses that you can replicate our stuff for free but you can't use the name open source ecology with it so that's one way to franchise uh, another way is to license stuff so actually interestingly if we bring this up uh and I, actually i don't want to get into this right now but uh, Dave Lee from the Shenzhen Open Innovation Lab, he wants to license the D3D printer to sell under the OSC slash uh, Shenzhen Open Innovation Lab label. That's actually currently in progress, but but um, licensing things, meaning that they are able to use our name, our brand called Open Source Ecology, which has a, which has a certain reputation with it, and they would pay us for that. So that's that's one way where uh, people are replicating independently but it would ha help if we can actually help people develop turnkey enterprises doing our work so that's the next level after production engineering 
And that's kind of like what we tried, you can say, with the immersion program to really get to the franchise level. But it's like, I think that's actually a little down the road. So then at step number 10, you have stable enterprise. So it's getting out there. People are replicating. And it's actually getting economic traction. And then you go to stage 11, where you actually have documentation and improvements to the point where everything is in place. So things like, oh, you can have a workbench in FreeCAD to design a turnkey new version of your 3D printer, or like full, whatever, full support, uh, support, full documentation, maybe full model kits where there's tons of kids playing with these things as scale models or whatever kits. Is that like the ultimate where you see that this thing is starting to dominate? Um, known examples maybe. Uh, hold, hold on, let me just finish this. Maybe you can say that viral replication is a 3D printer. Like those guys went viral. They make like 8,000 printers a month right now. So that's kind of like the last thing. But the, in theory, if this is taking the full effect of open source development to what open source can be, it will be like Linux, where it becomes viral. It dominates. Linux right now clearly dominates. That doesn't happen for nothing in hardware. But that's the, I would say, the 11th ultimate phase. OK, questions? Uh, yes, uh, question. Uh, my question is, why documentation, documentation is after stable enterprise? It looks like uh, it's hard to, um, to let the people document their work and then if uh, if someone already in the face of stable enterprise yeah. what is the motivation yeah. yeah no i agree with you but if you do what you say you get the osc wiki it's a mess no i'm kidding but the idea is yes of course we document everywhere but at the end of the day uh the documentation is really really high quality you know um i would say that the actual current 3d printer manual is somewhat of what I mean by number 11. It's really super detailed, well, ref decent, really refined, it could still be better. But 11 really means like getting that to a super level, like that level of documentation it would be, for example, the instructionals for how you build the 3D printer. That's, that's the kind of level we're talking about, uh, where it becomes super easy for somebody to source the materials and build it all in an augmented reality or AI environment or whatever, uh, just really, really top quality. So we're, we're like almost there on a kind of there on the 3D printer minus some things like, like I would say that that level of documentation would include the 3D printer design workbench and FreeCAD, because that means that any novice can now make modifications. So it's it's just really the degree of which at which we we do it and of course the documentation is there all the time from the beginning uh like on a wiki uh, maybe maybe to uh it's it's still i, I think we still need uh, a lot of time to add some structure to all the available documentation and keep it also up to date with software now it looks more like, uh, like a labyrinth uh, yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, of, lot, lot that needs to happen there. And I think the biggest thing there is a taxonomy, like understanding what the structure of the development process is and what are all the assets to go into that development. That's a cultural learning. It's like instead of people watching football, they should be learning how to organize the wiki for open source product development so unless like a cultural literacy happens in markets it's, it's kind of fight finally make it go forward is the financial feedback loops that's how Linux did it we have to get that within hardware so the feedback loops on economics meaning that uh, sales are happening or products are being made for real value and people are actually starting to get livelihoods from this work. That's the missing link. Like we can talk all about the wiki, but un until there's more than myself and Katarina and I don't know how many other people uh, making a living from this, this will not grow. So the livelihood part is, is uh, very important.
and hence the idea of okay the product release has to happen like the the, the linux learning is that very soon after 1991 uh, when I think the first Linux kernel was released, like within a few years of that, there were corporations throwing millions of dollars and pretty soon billions of dollars at the no, enterprise. I understand it, uh, but uh, the documentation part, I, I'm not very sure if someone who already will give money from uh, from all the development uh, will invest into the documentation. For sure, there are reasons to do it, uh, may, uh, maybe uh, to, to be altruistic um well, is. i i mean in all honesty i don't see the documentation happening until we can have people paid or making their living from it so okay so let's be explicit so for us what i'd like to see here is within a decade so i'm saying like we got 10 years of to finish the gvcs but building the village campus so that means dedicated communities which are like universities that uh people get the, get their livelihood from developing open source stuff um the financial feedback loops come to the point where a, an organization like osc can then pay people to steward the documentation or simply hire somebody to print a manual or whatever but somehow we have to give energy towards an explicit documentation effort because because you're right, like without, um, if you de depend on altruism for that to happen, it may or may not. I mean, but you can be very deliberate about it. Like once we have a product release, we start a business, we generate revenue, we allocate some of that revenue to documentation. So professional level documentation, like normal companies do. They'll publish whatever literature they publish, but they have to pay someone to do that. So some somewhere... Uh, that process has to be stewarded by feeding energy into that very explicitly, not just by relying on, say, a volunteer to document something. Because because we know that documentation is very intense. It takes a lot of time. It's, uh, uh, yes, which is why I spoke about it. Many people like to do stuff but don't like to document. That's true. I mean, that's right. That's part of the, the challenge. Because if you notice the comparison to code, Yes, I, I thought about code. Uh, right. It's and how does it happen in code? Not always well, voluntarily. Well, I mean, ideally, good code is well documented, right? Well, so it's I think in code. Ruslan said pointed this out before is that these days good code is written with enough verbosity and explanation such that it doesn't need a lot of documentation. I think that's kind of the more modern position. You write yeah. a lot of documentation in the code itself. And exactly. so for us, the, the software, I mean, we say we're designing hardware, but really we're designing software plans for hardware most of the time until the actual you know machine is built. Right. So it's about right. having the software work well enough that it documents everything sort of systemically. I mean, if the CAD and everything in the documents are detailed enough, we do a good enough job with the documentation, right. we can everything, it's, you know, planned out thoroughly enough, then it should all be there. Um, and That's I right. guess what I was in the notes on yeah. the side was, I think more of it is, uh, once you actually get some complete systems, whether it's the 3D printing systems and filament and all that, or the CB press or whatever, businesses subcontract everything out so much these days that they want everything done for them <laughs> for some sub business person or a contractor will come on and take you know on uh, a different a very different method of business so it's like we need to have a lot of documentation and planning and demonstration that the business models will work easily for them <laughs> they just want it you know easy low risk you know yeah. that's another issue i think yeah. I also want, uh, from a pr practical point of view, now I am struggling sometimes to uh, to uh, to make to set up a 3D printer because I need to navigate through all the documentation and look at in internet what what goes wrong and why it doesn't work, and um, there is no some kind of linear documentation. You go from point one to two to three to four. And uh, if it doesn't work, then uh, look chapter uh, troubleshooting. It's uh, ju just a lot of uh, linked 
pages uh, with the different yeah. versions of software and hardware. And this is a structure which make it's for me hard to to start. It is. It is unless unless there's a rigorous technique followed by everyone on a team. That's that's just hard. And we're trying to get to this. And and part of this is uh, why I want to write the book. Because you have to understand the whole framework of how this happens. And without having that, it's really a cultural change, you know, like there's going to be have to be a lot of people who understand the whole process. So um, and it's not easy because there's so many moving parts. So this is not an easy, easy thing. Yes, and also um, from didactical point of view and from writing point of view, how you structure um, your thoughts and ideas in such a way that it's easy to understand, as easy as possible. It and costs a lot of uh, time and effort. And uh, right. you need experience until you get uh, to the point that you can write stuff which contains dense and easy digestible information as far as right. possible. Right. And, and the thing about the wiki, like the wiki is a mess, of course, right? But it's got a lot of content and but it's precious waste because like precious plastic it's precious plastic because um the thing is you put a layer on top of that of organization so you take that professional uh information architect or someone who really understands the didactical point like you say and understands how to structure information they can come into the project and they can simply start organizing stuff so there's there's many different levels. That would be like the maintainer or the organizer or the editor of the wiki. But right now, you know, we could use all those people, and and that's that's needed. So the foundation we're building on, building right now is good, but it does need a lot of work or reformatting or or rework, um, just organizing it into a high higher state of development. Okay. Yeah. In the hardware case, like um, imagine, like the way I think about har hardware is okay. There's uh, just just to give you the framework of how I look at it, it might help you. Um, there's a bunch of mess on the wiki, but whatever is on the wiki doesn't matter. What matters is at the end of the day, a thing that is built that serves a real purpose. So, for example, if there's an instance of all that, like all you will need regarding whatever tractor construction set power cubes hydraulics automation this or that will be embodied in a single instance of that such as an autonomous tractor that you can see in a physical life and then you can take that physical artifact and and say that okay if the nuclear whatever a magnetic pulse wiped out all the wiki then you have that physical artifact and from that, you can reconstruct the whole um, information base around that. So that in, all that information has to be translated into physical artifact at some point. And, I, and I, I like to think that the physical artifact is a summary. That's like the summary of all the information that happened before it. So I don't know if that helps, but that's kind of how I think about the mess of the documentation. It's all OK as long as I can build myself uh, professional grade micro tractor or a printer whatever and because we know that if we have those artifacts you can bring in the people that can then uh, extract all the documentation and put it on the wiki and put it in a really digestible form yes and pattern language helps with that who said that that's it's all about pattern language so once we un understand the taxonomy and a pattern language it's a piece of cake <laughs> but together is not easy. I mean, first of all, it's to understand there's a structure of technology, like a pattern language for technology or like a uh, pattern language for architecture, like Christopher Alexander. Um, but once you start seeing the patterns, you can uh, make more sense of it. Okay. But let's, hey, let's leave this here. This is a very complex thing. Uh, we're working on it. I'm hoping that the book will actually help shed some light on this thing because, I mean, you know, that's all I do for, you know, that's all I do with my ample spare time. Um, but I do recognize that the way we're going right now, 
we're not going to be done in a decade decade unless there's a major change in what happens and that change is going to be economic activity around this and the cultural literacy around it so so the economics come from real products the cultural literacy i think uh can be really enhanced by me writing the book um because this is not something i can do myself obviously and we need much more coordination than is currently happening so there's there's definitely um a lot to that needs to happen with that said Let's take it to the next meeting in our ample spare time. Okay, guys. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. And so next meeting, next Tuesday, 2 p.m., same time, we'll continue the discussions and progress. Thanks a lot. And Jennifer, please uh, record this. Uh, I don't know if you can send me a link. I don't know if you sent one to me, but please send me a link with the uh, recording so I can post it on OSE YouTube, Jen. So thanks a lot. Yeah, they're, in the, um, they're posted on the dev page, on the dev okay. log. Okay, thank you. And I, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, yeah, is it easier if I just email you links? I can email you links. That is yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I will email you. I, can, I will yeah. email you links, Marchin. Thank you. Not a problem. You are so welcome. Thank you. All right, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Till next week. Bye -bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.